Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape oil painting demonstration. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy, and the painting I'm bringing you today is uh, the latest and greatest entry into our solo pigment series. It's Thalo Blue, a wonderful, wonderful color. Thalo Blue, come on up, take a bow, take a bow. Thalo Blue, we love you. We really do. Yeah. In fact, uh, last video was Cobalt Blue. There's lots of times I've got them both in my palette, but I will be honest, I really, really, really love Cobalt Blue, but if I had to have only one blue, it would be Thalo. Mm. Uh, why? You say, why? If, if you love Cobalt so much, why do you love Thalo more? I actually don't even want to say I love Thalo more, but you know, the proof is in, you know, uh, what you would have on your palette always, and there's always going to be a bit of phthalo, a blue on my palette. I love it more, and you know what, uh, doing some research for this video, I've got some, uh, some articles I'm going to read, um, after we talk about, uh, a little bit about my history, uh, with phthalo, and, uh, you know, my interactions with it, um, uh, in doing that research, one of the things it mentioned, it contrasted it with ultra, ultramarine blue, and, um, not so much with cobalt, I don't know why, but uh, it's cleaner in a mix. It's that simple. It's cleaner in a mix. And you always mix Thalo Blue. You never use it straight from the tube. Uh, as you can see, so I took this, uh, this um, by the way, that house in the uh, painting there, it's going to disappear, didn't work out. Just was too fiddly and not what I'm after in this uh, study. But. I might do the scene again and, and do that house justice. So uh, now, ultramarine blue tends to lean uh, towards the purple side, and phthalo blue tends to lead, lean towards the green side. Very interestingly, um, phthalo green is sort of a byproduct of the phthalo blue. And you know, I had a really big headache um, when uh, when I did the phthalo green painting. It didn't look right in the camera. It looked totally wrong, and I just found out why in these scientific articles. There's a, a bronze or brown element that's part of the pigment, which is not that apparent to our human vision, but throws the camera off. Um, and uh, you know, of course, uh, as I was started dealing with the video, I was you know forgetting my actual perceptions in the moment. But there was a big discrepancy there. Interesting, eh? Not so much with this thalo though. Not as big a deal. Um, I got into Thalo Blue probably about, ooh, I don't know, six, seven years ago. I've had it with me for a while. It's very reasonable pigment, um, very versatile. Uh, another article I'm not going to read, but the guy was mentioning how he likes to get these variants of of Thalo Blue to put on his palette instead of Thalo Blue, and all they all they were basically is Thalo Blue with a little bit of white in it. I mean. Okay, yeah, that makes sense though. It makes sense. You, you might want to try that. Um, have have a little bit of white in your phthalo blue. But, you know, the the way I've always put it is that a lot of colors, these uh, the the, the, the uh, phthalo blue, the ultramarine, phthalo green, a lot of these colors don't don't really identify their true nature until you hit them with some white or some yellow um, or something like that. Yeah, they uh, they're just dark, you know. Um, it, it's, I think I might try in some parts of this painting to get just straight up solid Thalo Blue, which is um, something I've, uh, you know, to, tried to do in each painting in this series. Now this was going to be the last painting in the series, but I've got Titanium uh, White and Mars Black. Uh, they, they need their due, they need their research done, so hopefully I've got a board in the studio that's got a gray uh, primer on it. otherwise I'll have to do that today and then whip up a painting and I just want to so this was all going to go into a playlist and um, anyone that made their way through the playlist would come out of it with a real good comprehension of um, which pigments I'm using why I'm using in my history with them and uh, some you know a, a bit of uh, you know the scientific uh, aspects of them and their history so I think that's just valuable and um, you know, well, it's not as important as just getting the paints out and making a painting, you know. 
it, it, it does engage your imagination and I think that has value yeah so uh, like I said I've had Thalo with me for a while it'd be it'd be my it'd be my blue if I could only have one it'd be Thalo gave away that tube of ultramarine I bought to do a study with <laughs> I don't need it I just don't you know can I say the cobalt I'm hanging on to though and cobalt's beautiful but look how beautiful this blue is I mean psh, and it's half maybe a third the price you know and these things matter especially if uh, you're making big paintings right <clears throat> anyway let's get into some of the uh, scientifical type uh, not just scientific I, I found a really nice article um, it does get a little heady it does get a little heady but uh, we can hang, we can hang. Just uh, we'll just roll on over some of these words, you know. And uh, uh, this was pigment of the month, Thalo Blue. This is for the site, the con conservationcenter.com. Nice. Just going to read most of their article. This is uh, pigment of the month, conservationcenter.com. Might be a good site to look into more. And they have a nice picture of old Bob Ross there, painting one of his nice little paintings, you know. Theta Blue is a pigment you've seen thousands of times before, but may not have had a name to put to the color. It's the sea, the sky, and in the case of Bob Ross, snowy accents in his paintings. And those are Theta Blue accents. The search for the quote-unquote perfect blue plagued artists throughout history as they look for a shade that captured hues visible but not available in nature. Like, what they means is like, you can see the color, but you didn't have a pigment that you could use to render it. Yeah. Um like the color of the ocean. Thalo Blue, a staple on many of today's artist palette, was a solution indeed in its purest form. It's awesome. There's a nice swatch of it there. And it does. It leans towards the green a little. So that's one reason I have Cobalt uh, and Thalo. Cobalt doesn't really... Cobalt's more neutral. It doesn't lean purple or uh, green. You know, it's kind of right in there in that blue zone. Uh, I'm not going to name, uh, oh well, Thalo Cyanine Blue <laughs> is an organic blue developed by chemists under the name of Mon Monastrol Blue. The color was presented as a pigment in London in November of 1935. At the time, it was claimed to be the most important blue discovery since Prussian Blue in 1704 and Artificial Ultramarine in 1824. Hmm. And many even argued that it was a superior pigment to both. I could make that argument. I definitely could. Uh, Prussian. Eh. Prussian's more green. You know, Thalo totally, you know. Thalo is Prussian blue on steroids. I'll say that. <clears throat> Although I'm, I'm 10 years away from messing with Thalo blue, so forgive me if I'm, uh, you know, speaking ignorantly here. And you love uh, Prussian blue. According to the history of known pigments and their chemical makeup, 7, 7 AD to present, it is prepared by fusing <laughs> phthalic anhydride to, and urea to copper chloride, first washing it, etc., etc. I won't get through all this, but it is um, uh, it was resulting, resulting paste thus directly used in the preparation of lakes. And lakes, uh, what I did learn in this series, um, lakes is a way of binding your pigment to a metal like zinc. Yeah, and which which gives it properties that um, make it work with the, uh, in paint much better, yeah. Uh, but the one of the reasons I didn't want to skip all of this, uh, it's a highly complex organic synthesis, all the stuff I just didn't read, which was like, you know, not just $10 words, they're $20 words. Uh, pure copper thylocyanine in a crystalline form is a deep blue with a strong blonde bronze reflection, but when dry in pigment form is bright blue without any bronziness. Hmm, that thalo, that thalo green painting I did had bronziness in the camera, but not visually to my eye. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. 
there were other silo thalosilane colors which were well, which were equally li light fast. However, when photographed, this line of colors tends to turn brown in the camera lens. Aha! Being logically attributed to the fact that though it absorbs all other colors of light, there must be some refractive or reflective bounce to the initial bronze tone of the mineral and crystal that is not evident to the eye. So there's things in your pig. It's like a dog whistle, right? There's a dog whistle in your pigment. Although ultramarine is the most universally accepted, accepted pigment on the landscape painter's palette, it cannot produce the distinct hue thalo can even when mixed with other colors. No, it can't. It can't make that color. But you could get it pretty close with thalo to some ultramarine stuff. I'd start kicking in a little bit of crimson, you know. I'd get there. I think I get there in black, maybe, I don't know. Although, perhaps not as historically riveting as costly vermilion or sought-after ultramarine, Thalo Blue is a modern solution to an age-old problem. How to paint the color of the sky. Very nice article. Oh, very glad, glad I found that. And happy to share it with you. Um, there's that other article by the guy that... Uh, <laughs> he, he doesn't like super strong Thalo. He likes to buy... They know that someone else added white too, and uh, yeah, I don't even want to get into Wikipedia's uh, deal because that's just straight up chemistry. All these little hexagonal diagrams and um, uh, and whatnot. So hopefully that gives you some insight. Though we know it's another one of these 20th century pigments. Um, we know we love it, and we know it's beautiful. And you can see I got rid of that house and. It was looking okay at many stages, right? Now this uh, this painting is based on a, a very old pictorially a pictorialist photo. I don't know why I always do that. Pictorialist. I mean, might even be accurate. I don't know. But <clears throat> nice photo. Really awesome composition. The kind of composition I really like. Maybe a bit of a steelyard thing going on, right? Not that I'm any expert on that stuff, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I got rid of the house and 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 uh, just made it a tree. And this is something you can do in your paintings too, since we have an extra moment or two here. You don't have to be a slave to the reference. That reference isn't your boss. <laughs> it isn't the boss of you. You could do what you want, okay? And I don't hesitate anymore. I'm just telling you. Um, Although, like I said, it would have been, I think, a stronger painting with a little house in it. But the point of the painting was to kind of get, uh, I would have had to start breaking out the T-square and, and thinking and, and focusing in, um, in a way I didn't really want to do uh, for this study. So I left it alone, um, which is another, you know, good lesson. Know what you're after and do that, you know. Uh, at least that's my opinion. Um, as I mentioned earlier, though, it might be cool to uh, to do a painting with uh, that house in it. Um, and there may be some uh, some people that are members on my uh, on the membership port portion of the channel. If they're uh, if you watch this video, you're into it. Let me know. I'll send you the uh, I'll send you the picky. You can paint it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we're getting pretty close to the end here. Like I said, this was supposed to be the last in the series. This is, uh, but this isn't the last color of my palette. Though, what you'll see at the very end of my palette is after this, you'll see black, and then Mike's gray, and uh, over then it would loop around back to white over on the other side of the palette. So, I have decided I will do one additional um, uh, painting in this series, which will be. I, it, I owe it to Mars Black because Mars Black saved my bacon for this whole series. I, I owe it to Mars Black to uh, to look up and research it a little bit, to find out what's up about it, and uh, I can see the value of it. And um, although I have to say, for most of the way I paint my regular pictures, uh, ivory black is really better for me. But um, I definitely know what I could do with Mars Black and why I would need to have it around. And uh, it would have been in interesting to maybe see if Black Spinel could have done the job instead. Black Spinel rated as opa opaque, but I'm constantly using it as a transparent because it has such a high pigment load and very, very fine particles, you know. Anyway, I'm burbling as usual. Thank you so much for joining me today. Just put a really nice painting in my store. It's got a good price on it, too. Go check it out. 
Um, and if you got some value here, you can uh, send me a donation or just, you know, thanks for watching. Uh, you know, I appreciate it. I hope you're having a good holiday season. And uh, I'd love you to take good care of yourself and your family, all your loved ones, and be patient with uh, people who have points of view that differ from your own. And uh, take good care and stay out of trouble.